and we are live. Good. Hey, um, welcome uh, those who are watching. My name is Brooke Lester, and this is a Hangout interview with Amy Erickson. Uh, this is in service to UTIL 16, the Open Old Testament Learning Event, uh, which can be found at util16.net. And with me today is uh, Dr. Amy Erickson, who is associate yes. professor. Associate, uh-huh. congratulations, by the way, Thank Associate you. Professor uh, of Hebrew Bible at the ILIF School of Theology. That's right. Is that we the correct not, way to say ILIF? We are not a seminary. You are yes. not a seminary. You're a school of theology. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about that um, um, on our way to talking about anything else. So, And I'm Brooke Lester. I'm at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Well, Amy, welcome. It's great to, it's great to see you. Oh, it's fun to be here. Thanks. Yeah, well, okay. So, okay. So, um we're going to talk, the things that we may talk about today include uh, things around the former prophets, the Davidic monarchy, and the royal theology, just because that's where my learners happen to be right now. Uh, but because I have uh, Amy here, I would also want to be sure that we uh, talk a little bit about metaphor along the way, because uh, that's something that you and I are both interested in, each in our own way. We've talked about it before. And reception history, because it's something you do these days. Um, and I'm always full of questions about it because some, some of the people I like and respect most in the field are doing reception history. And if you are classically trained in the way that a lot of us are, um, that was not a thing that we did and for reasons. And so I'm hoping that that'll come in and, uh, just whatever else is going on. I have no idea what Amy you're teaching this term and what might have your interest in, ter- in, in the teaching that you're doing right now. So we're, well, we just can, so happens, yeah. I'm teaching a course on poetry in the Hebrew Bible. No kidding. Uh-huh. And so next week, we're going to be talking about metaphor and how metaphor works. And we're going to be looking at uh, the image of Zion in Psalm 46 and Psalm 48. So and I think and I wrote a piece on that, too. So I have thought of, it's been a while, but I have thought about Zion metaphors in those Psalms. And uh, reception history, one of my doctoral students is taking a comp in reception history next week. So, yes, I have been thinking a lot about both of those things. And I, I just, I forced a graduate student to listen to my standard issue rant um, over lunch today about how uh, nobody is raised with poetry in their education anymore. And that's a part of why we end up talking, pa- our students and us sometimes end up talking past one another. Um, when we talk about poetry in the Bible and metaphor and so on. So, so okay. True. Yeah. All right. So we got a lot we can talk about during this yes. time. If we will. Uh-huh. So, but for starters, okay, we are both at United Methodist Institutions, as it happens, um, which is funny because as far as I know, neither one of us is United Methodist. But, no, and um, I don't, I, I have to remind myself sometimes that I'm at a Methodist institution. I never have to remind myself that I'm at a United Methodist I think that's institution. One of the nothing, nothing could be more clear, right? So they're not all created the same. Um, uh, I'm at a seminary, and a seminary is a place, right, where folks are mostly going into some kind of ordained ministry, um, uh, rather in the congregation or in something a, a little more off the beaten track, uh, chaplaincies and, and what have you. Although we've got the usual number of folks who are either doing an MDiv and don't know why, um, or are doing other master's degrees, like an MTS going on, who are planning on going on with, say, PhD work, or who are doing shorter MA degrees in, in other church-related things like music, worship, and, uh, or, 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 or what have you. Um, but, it, it, but the exceptions aside, for the most, fo- most part, folks are marching into the church in some way or another. And that's I'm, always yeah. really evident here. Like, I mean, you, you can't miss it. And would most of your students identify as Christian in some yes. shape or form? Yes, yeah. that is the case. So this is not true here at all. right. So talk to so I live school of theology, right? <laughs> um, uh, what's what is that? What it, what what means I live school of theology? Well, so we have probably fifty percent of our students on the MDiv track, okay. and of that fifty percent, probably twenty percent of them are not certain that that's what they want to do. They're not sure they really want to go into the church. And so I direct the MTS program, which means I get a lot of MDiv dropouts. And so we're fond of saying that we uh, educate people out of the church, which is unfortunate because I think that we don't have to think about those two things as incompatible, being educated, obviously, and being a part of the church. But 
because we have several faculty members who are atheist or agnostic, there's kind of a disconnect, I think, in our teaching sometimes between church people and non-church people. And so people feel like they have to pick a side, I think. So we have, we have a um, master's degree program. We just changed the name. We called it the Master's in Social Change. And now we're calling it Master's in Social Justice and Ethics. And so we have a lot of people who identify as activists. And um, we also have a military chaplaincy program and uh, with a focus on PTSD. And so we have a lot of folks in the military. Um, we have a lot of people who are here as seekers. They don't really know why they're here or what they're doing. They want to supplement some other degree program. But the Christian ethos is markedly tentative, I would say. I think it, we, so we have a, a Native American scholar who um, teaches on Native American cultures and religions. And basically his course is called, you know, Hating Christianity 101. So he talks about, um, you know, the role, the way in which Christianity is complicit in the colonization of Native peoples and, and walks people through Christianity and empire and that very uncomfortable relationship between the two and is not a practicing Christian himself and so finds no real way to reconcile those two things. So, yeah, we're kind of all over the place. I don't know what we're doing. See, I think that what's a part of, see, here's what's part of what's super interesting to me about that. And you'll know this and folks who... Well, I'll tell you, here's the thing. I think a lot of people would hear the way we're talking so far, people who are not familiar with seminaries and uh, uh, schools schools of higher education and religion and so on, and say, oh, okay, so Dr. Erickson is at something l more like, uh, I don't know, a history of religions or a religious studies kind of program uh, that has this Christian identity. It's associated with this uh, United Methodist Church. But in terms of what it does, I think a lot of folks would listen to this and say, oh, Dr. Erickson is at a place where they teach you how to think, right? Where, where you learn how to think about religion. And uh, Dr. Lester is at a place where they tell you what to believe, what to think, because uh, they're going to teach you how to believe rightly as a United Methodist, how to believe rightly about this stuff because we're going into the church. And what you and I will know is that it, actually that's not really the case, that in fact, uh, what, a lot of what you just described is what a person can expect at uh, Garrett Evangelical. And at uh, your sort of your typical, what we would call a mainline denomination theological seminary. That is, if you're at a Presbyterian seminary, uh, or PCUSA, I should say, a Presbyterian Church USA seminary, an Episcopal Church USA seminary, a United Methodist uh, UMC seminary, or, or a lot of these. Um, uh, when you're taking biblical study, you, you, a lot of folks, I think, I think students are sometimes surprised by this, that they also experience their courses here as hating Christianity 101. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, uh, uh, that what they learn in biblical studies class is not how to love the Bible properly and how to believe rightly concerning uh, some idea of inspiration of the, you know, the Holy Spirit's inspiration of the Bible or something like this. Uh, but the, what they're getting is a pretty secular, in terms of materials and methods, are getting a thoroughgoingly secular um, um, introduction to the Hebrew Bible. It's, it's, it's history, literature, and cultural studies. Right. Um, modulated or, or in, the, in, the, in the knowledge that the reason most of the folks are in this classroom is because they are people of a certain kind of faith who are going into leadership in a church. Um, does that make sense, right? And then just so yeah, in no, theology absolutely. and yes. certainly church history and so on, you know, certainly a lot of our theology classes are going to sound to some students like hating Christianity 101 uh, because the way that our commitments here are especially around um, um, Addressing system, what we addressing systemic evil, injustice, racism, um, you know, around social justice, economic sustainability, and and, and so on. That a, a lot of our courses are about the history of uh, uh, Christian people behaving badly. Right. right. Yeah. Right. No, I think that's right. Well, I actually was having dinner with David Frankfurter the other night. Um, we had our regional SBL AAR meeting, and he teaches at Boston University. He's a New Testament early Christian origins kind of guy, probably more early Christian history and Jewish history as well, I think. Anyway, he certainly identifies as a history of religions person, as somebody interested in the study of religion, and was saying quite disparaging, and I thought, uninformed things about seminaries and 
people who have a religious commitment and what that might look like in their scholarship. I know, kind of discrediting or being suspicious of folks with religious commitments, as if people who are studying religion without religious commitments don't have a dog in the race somehow in terms of how they understand it and what that looks like on the ground, you know, as if they can be more objective, which I found quite shocking because, you know, he's a really smart guy, really interesting scholar, and even he was displaying this bias, I thought. You know, and so maybe you all listening don't know it. Brooke and I both went to Princeton Theological Seminary, so we know that you can get good, solid training at a seminary. Yeah, and the and the, the formula at PTS right was go ahead and like you are definitely going to go and learn Akkadian. You are definitely going to go and learn Ugaritic. You're definitely going to learn um, about the 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 cultures around ancient Israel and, 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 and get steeped in all of that. And you're going to work in that. And it's totally okay to like sit down and just like read cuneiform for six hours. Uh, but sort of the expectation was that anyone should be able to walk up to you at any time and say, how does this serve the church? And, and you will have an answer, right? So, so that's a very PTS kind of um, way of being raised in this stuff. And, and, and it, it does sort of fit, that is, I think, a good way of describing what I experience as the usual mainline, the places that I've taught as adjuncts and elsewhere, I've taught at a lot of different denominational places, but they've all been denominational places. And uh, the, um, that fits. Like, do, you, do, yeah. you, do, your, do your history, do your literature, do your cultural studies, uh, do it in that way. Teach your students how to think critically rather than teaching them what to believe about God or about the Bible or about anything. Um, uh, but at the same time, have something to say about what good, you know, you really, you know, ought to be able to have something to say about what good this does the church, right? Um, right. The uh, theological implications. What are the theological implications of this work? I mean, I that's feel right. like that's the question I should be able to answer or to think through. There's a ton of United Methodist Church money flowing through this institution, and they ought to get something for that, right? And that's part of what that is, right? Is that, is right. that, is that, is that, is that, whereas at ILIF, less so, right? At ILIF, less um, money, for sure. Less money involved and less, less accountability of that kind, right? And fewer, and fewer students asking those questions, those kinds yeah. of questions, because uh, they're going into nonprofit organizations. Uh, they're going into the academy. They identify um, as, I say, more and more of them are identifying as atheist or agnostic or post-Christian. That's the other term I've been hearing thrown around these days. So with fewer students asking those kinds of questions, your conversations look different, I think. Yeah, but and yet for all that, I think you and I, you know, we, 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 we take a moment here to sort of make these distinctions between uh, an Iliff School of Theology and a Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Uh, but at the same time, I know that we both experience, really, we both think of ourselves as on one side of a line that's maybe more important to us as biblical scholars or more visible to us as biblical scholars, which is the line between statement of faith organizations and non-statement of faith organizations, right? Exactly, is, um, exactly, um, yes. I do not have to sign, obviously you don't, and, 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 and some folks won't know that I don't, have to sign a statement of faith about that I subscribe to either United Methodist you know, religious tenets or um, uh, uh, Protestant religious tenets more broadly conceived. And my scholarship does not have to produce results that agree with, um, uh, say, the United Methodist Church Book of Discipline, for example, or something right. like that, right? And that, for us, really is the more important um, uh, line. And it's the line we see, and this comes up in conversations among biblical scholars all the time, is, you know, SBL, right, the Society our Flagship Organization, embraces both sets of institutions, the institutions where uh, biblical studies, church history, theology is in service not just to the church, uh, but is in service to a confession, to a catechism, to a, a set of beliefs that is written down uh, that your work will, will the, a set of beliefs that is so self-evidently true that of course your research and scholarship will produce results that cohere with these beliefs because it, they, they have to, because these things are, are, are accepted as true at the outset over against in institutions like my own, um, and obviously yours and, and, and what I would call, call mainline institutions where uh, what I call, what I would describe as academic freedom 
is right. in place, right? Uh, if yeah. your best archaeological work produces the result that, you know, there just could not have been any Israelites, you know, there could not have been a wall at Jericho at any time that any Israelites of any kind were marching through. Uh, that's just the way that cookie crumbles. That's right. That's right. Well, and, uh, we have Denver Seminary here in town, which is a, a, a an institution that requires you to sign this confession or statement of faith or something before you can even take a class there. So I have students who uh, want to take language classes there because they've got great Bible people and they bring it and they say, well, I can't sign this. So you can't even take a course there without signing this document. So yeah, that seems to me a serious limitation on your academic and intellectual freedom. So you mentioned you're, you're teaching a class, you're going to be teaching um, a session on a class or a session on poetry, right? On poetry in, in the Hebrew Bible. And the whole I, seminar I, I, is poetry. This, the what? The whole seminar is on poetry. The whole seminar is on poetry. Oh, that just makes me swoon. Right. So, so the short version of my rant and, and, and we've, we've, it's, it'll be familiar to some and, and others and others say this kind of thing is one of the things that happens when we tell students that, um, especially students, well, I wouldn't even say, when we tell, stu when we tell students that, that there's a lot of the Bible is metaphor, a lot of the Bible is in poetry, a lot of the Bible uses figures to communicate, it communicates figuratively rather than literally, not all of it, but a lot of it and in different ways. Um, for a lot of students, that's 100% fine. For a lot of students, that's just, that is not a problem at all. For other students, it is a problem. Sometimes that's a problem because I, I guess, we tend to think of it as like a kind of fundamentalism, right? That is all the Bible has to be literally true or it's not true at all. But for me, there's kind of a deeper stratum here just about education, right? That is either you have been raised in such a way that you have had your life changed by fiction. You have had your world moved by poetry you have completely reevaluated the you see the way you see the world uh because of the way certain figures or metaphors or literature or music or other art has affected you and either you've had that experience or you haven't right and so when someone says oh a lot of the bible we we're going to read the bible as literature we're going to re read this text as a work of art and see the rhetorical devices by which it accomplishes it's our artistic and it's artistic endeavors. Um, and there's that, that, that's response that you get from some where, which, which I mean, to, to quote nearly exactly one student, I remember, well, if the Bible is, 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 is literature, then, then, we, then we just put it on the shelf with the rest of the fairy tales and walk away. And my response to that is why would you put fairy tales on the shelf and walk away? Why would you put fiction on that? That's not what you do with fiction. You don't put it on the shelf and walk away. But for this student, something in their education had, has raised them to believe that that whole everything that is non, everything outside of the narrow realm of the non-fictional, right, is superfluous, extra, non-essential, um frivolous so true yeah i mean people smarter than me can go back to like you know the aristotles and everything and kind of follow this divide you know concerning aesthetics and so like that right up to the present but for my purposes i'm just interested in where we are now with that you know what i mean um and yeah. just sort of the practical pedagogical problem there right okay well so so many things came to mind as you were talking there but just to follow up on what you were saying even in scholarship on biblical literature, people who are really doing good work with the text, you'll still see this language of mere metaphor. Metaphor is just ornamental and it doesn't do anything to change your way of seeing the world. And I think that the really interesting metaphor theory that I read and thinking about how it works when reading metaphor in the Bible is to think about how does that change your perspective on the world? How do you see the world differently because you looked through the lens of this particular metaphor? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I have experienced transformation through engaging literature, by engaging literature, and by having my world completely upended by metaphors. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to bring to my students. But today we, we sat down, we've been doing all this technical stuff with how do parallel lines work together? What's the relationship between the two lines? And trying to learn the new language of speaking about poetry. And today I went in and I said, I, I hope you remember why we're doing this. So let's, let's stop and reflect for a moment about why this is 
interesting, why this is cool, why we're sitting here laboring over, you know, whether these lines are semantically parallel or antithetically parallel or, you know, are existing in some other type of relationship. And I compared it to my new favorite pastime, which is fly fishing. And in fly fishing, what I'm doing is, is really slowing down and appreciating sort of ordinary quotidian aspects of creation and trying to really appreciate how they teach me to experience the world differently. So I never cared about bugs. In fact, I found bugs to be annoying. I'm suddenly now like obsessive about entomology. So my understanding of like whether or not uh, the, the mayfly is in its nymphal or in its emerger stage or if it's a dun coming off the water or if it's a spinner dying on the water and how the trout are going to respond to that has completely changed the way I engage my environment and the way I think about my spiritual life, actually, if I can call it that. It's such a weird throwaway kind of a term. But um, and, and that's what poetry does for me, the slowing down and the putting the pieces together and seeing my place in the world differently, seeing the world through different eyes, in particular the eyes of the Hebrew poets. So it kind of becomes a way of almost like the, what I hear you saying is that like fly fishing for you is whatever else it accomplishes for you. It is one way of being tricked into paying attention to the world around you in a way that maybe you habitually don't, right? That is, we've always yeah, got our exactly filters right. up. We, you know, human beings always have a million filters up. So we only pay attention to what's important and we don't pay too much attention to what's not important. Right. Um, and fly fishing for other, for me, bird watching would be the, it would, would be the thing, right? That is yeah. Uh, yeah. bird watching becomes a way of tricking myself into paying attention to my environment in a way that I normally wouldn't. So yeah, I mean, hopefully I see birds. That's always nice. Sometimes I don't see birds, but even when I don't see birds, I'm going to see a lot of other things. And, and quite aside from just sort of the, I don't know, arithmetic value of whatever things I see, there's the experience of being more openly and broadly alive, is there not, right? Like regardless yeah. of whether I see this or that while fly fishing or bird watching, the period of time in which I am in this open state, this open state of uh that is well it's open <laughs> um is is changes one right that yeah. that changes me open but not uh, not open to anything i mean you're, you're being open in a very specific way because you're trying to turn your attention to details that you would have missed before Right. So, so, so I, I think where I run into trouble, just being open, like, you know, sort of sitting uh, by a stream, looking at the water, I'm pretty much always going to see that water in the same way if I'm engaging pre-fly fishing. Now I'm thinking, okay, well, what about that bubble line right there? Are fish there? And what about that rock? And look at that eddy. And now, oh, here come the mergansers swimming down. And I can see how the current is moving a little bit more clearly by the way it's pooling up around the duck's feathers you know so so it, it lends me that um that focus that i wouldn't have have otherwise which and I, so i see my students engaging a poem and I, I i just said to one of my students who asked me one of my doctoral students said how's the poetry class going and i said well if you'd asked me two weeks ago i would have said disastrous disastrous because i come in prepared to talk about five verses of a poem for an hour and think that's not going to be enough time. And the first couple of weeks, my students are coming in saying, well, I kind of get the sense that the poet is sad. Or I, I, I kind of think uh, he's a little angry here. Or, and I see some, you know, some, some lament language. How about that? And now that we're digging in and asking these questions, well, what kind of an image is the poet using to speak about his grief? And how does that change over the course of the poem? And now, you know, how do the pronouns change? And how do the subjects? And what about the verbs? And how does this line fit with that line? And all of a sudden, I can see them kind of waking up and saying, oh, oh, wait, poetry is kind of cool. I never thought to read literature this way. This is that um, Billy Collins introduction to poetry thing, isn't it, that we're talking about, right? So for the, the so for the Billy Collins wrote a poem called Introduction to Poetry, and uh, he says that he wants you go and look it up, everyone who listens. But um, uh, 
but paraphrasing him briefly to make the point, he talks about like he wants students to like engage the poem this way and uh, be moved by the one and, and to play with the poem this way and play with the poem that way and play. And they just want to know what it means. Like they, the, 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 the student just wants to know what the poem means. And in your fly fishing metaphor, that's like saying, you know, well, look, have we caught a trout or not? Exactly. Like what this is all about is catching trout. So at the end of the day, what matters is, is there a trout in the basket or is there not a trout in the basket and how many? And, oh, and how big and how, and big. how big, right? How big is the trout? And uh, in the poetry version of the, when we, when we transpose that to poetry, it's the, what does it mean? Oh, I think the poet is saying they're sad. So that's what this poem means. It's a poem about sad. And now that I know it's a poem about sad, I don't need to engage the poem anymore. I have gotten the trout that I was after and I can now just go home and cook it. Um, but, uh, but the fly fisher knows that it's, it's really about what's happening in the fly fishing itself. And, 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 and you as the instructor of poetry are saying, yeah, okay, sad, fine, fine, fine. But, but this isn't just, when we're talking about, it's not just what is the poem about, it's how is the poem about that? What choices does the poet, does the poem make? And um, what happens in us as we sort of engage those decisions and try to understand them better or become more aware of them? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so we did this exercise today where I give them uh, the first line of a set of parallel lines, and then they have to write the second line. And then, or they write a verse. So they, I give them, you know, three lines of poetry, and then they write the next three, the next verse. And then we talk about what choices they made and why. And then we look at the biblical text and see what choices they made and why. And then once you start to put yourself in the role of writer, I think that then you engage more. So the other thing that's happening in fly fishing, okay, so it's, are, are we overdoing the fly fishing thing? You can tell me to stop on this because this is my latest obsession. I, I think we're okay. Okay, all right. On the fly fishing, so, continue. So my, <laughs> my, my partner is, is better at fishing than I am. He started fishing when he was young and we're doing it together right now. And he has been tying my knots for me. He's been tying the hooks and the flies on the line for me. And I said to him the other day, I'm like, you got to stop doing this. You got to let me be frustrated. You got to let me take ownership of this part of the fishing. Because of course, this is probably the hardest uh, place to enjoy fishing is when you are, are tying these little knots on this uh, thin little microfilament. But that's part of it, right? That, that, that being involved in the process all the way down to reading the poem, to writing the poem. So the how can you be more active in your reading? And I've got so one of the books they're reading in the class is um, Mary Kinsey's Guide to Poetry. And, and she says that the best way to learn how to read poetry is to write poetry. So that's what we're going with. <laughs> there's, a, there's a line in, there was a movie, uh, Mr. Holland's Opus, Once Upon a Time, right? And in the movie, Mr. Holland's Opus, uh, the, the protagonist tells a story about how, the, I, think he was telling, I think it was Cole, it might be Cole Porter, I might be misremembering, but he said, said he, he, when he first listened to Cole Porter, he hated it. He just hated everything about the whole album that he listened to. Maybe it wasn't Cole Porter, whoever it was. Um, and but he he was so frustrated by how much he hated it he had to go back and play it again and he like could not stop playing it over and over and over and eventually it became his favorite his favorite music and when you talk about learning to tie the knots right there's we have an expectation i think about poetry often that it's always going to be really fun or something like like that or that you as the instructor that what you hope is that the students will just love the poetry they just love it and the, the, the verses will fall on their ears you know in this like but it's like a lot of times you know when you're a part of the a part of what you're experiencing is like not understanding things right. you know it, it, i think that's one of my favorite things about poetry um i'm going to invoke here as i as i do i think pretty regularly um our one of our pastoral care professors here pam holloman uh, talks with her students about listening. And, and one of the points she makes about listening over and over again from a clinical perspective, from a pastoral care perspective, is the, import, the willingness to not understand, mm. right? As opposed to rushing to understanding or filling in and understanding prematurely, which is just a way of silencing the other person. And uh, so that willingness to not understand is 
for me, that's one of my favorite things about, that's one of the defining aspects of poetry is that, you know, by reading poetry, I am putting myself in a situation where I am not going to understand. Like, I don't know what else is going to happen when I read the poem, but I guarantee I am not going to understand. And putting myself in that position over and over and over again on purpose, because I believe I'm getting something out of it, then I think it changes the way you read everything and include, including the Bible, both the poetic Ooh, part, both the parts that are poetry and the parts that are not poetry. Right. Um, um, that is if it gets me out of that frame of mind where when I read something, it's because it has some, some piece of information that I want to have and I'm going to go get it, you know, um, from this, from this, from this, from this piece of uh, bookmark, book, bookmark theology, right? When you're yeah. feeling sad, read these verses. When you're feeling angry at your brother, read these verses, you know, and so on. That these are all, these are all verses, little fortune cookies that have information or insights that are there that you can just go get. Um, as opposed to a voice that you're just often not going to understand and that's not a problem. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with that voice. That doesn't mean that they are a problem, that the text is a problem. People read biblical texts and they read, they get to the part they don't understand, usually in Leviticus somewhere or something like that, or in a genealogy. And it's like, well, obviously that's a problem. And, and just the, the choice to engage poetry is always going to keep raising that question when you say, well, I don't understand this and that's a problem. And, 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 and poetry sort of kind of looks at you. Is it? Is it a problem? Is, is that the problem? Are you sure? Yeah, no, that's really good. Well, I was talking today about how the other thing that poetry does is it puts us out of that consumer mindset that I think we slip into so easily in upper middle class America, white society, right? So I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to buy this and I'm going to get this. I'm going to look at this and I'll and I'll know, you know, there'll be some result that I can immediately quantify and with poetry, you kind of just have to sit there and say, how is this going to preach? How do I apply this knowledge? No, that's not the right question. How do I sit with the unknowing? How do I come at it with different kinds of questions and different kinds of insights from other places in my life? How does that connect me more deeply to the poem? And it's funny, I was just using the example of pastoral care today in the poetry class saying, all right, so half of the students in the room have some connection or some interest in becoming pastoral caregivers and talking about reading poetry, listening to poetry in a way that's analogous to the way that you listen to a person. And you're listening based on your training, based on all of these courses that teach you to think about family systems. So you can ask good questions of the person in front of you and you can embrace your unknowing to the and, and you ask more questions and more questions. And the more you read and the more you think about how pastoral care works or how human beings work or how emotions work, well, then you can just continue to ask better questions that help you engage that poem and that person more deeply, more meaningfully. All right, so let me ask you this. Okay. Um, when I read an Anne Sexton or a Maya Angelou, right, or, or uh, a Charles Wallace, you know, or, or any, of these, any of these modern poets, mm -hmm. they're going to say pretty vehemently that they don't necessarily, they don't have a point, right? That we, we sort of, as we talked about, like with the trout earlier, you know, that I, I'm not supposed to read their poem and try to find out what they're trying to say, you know? Um, but in the biblical text, we're not reading a book of poetry, for example, that's like a book of Anne Sexton's love poems, right? We, right? we get a sense that we're reading works that we're actually trying to communicate some things that were pretty specific. And so, for instance, Paul, right, um, uh, in the New Testament. Paul is usually trying to communicate something that it is actually important to him that you get it and that you agree with him by the time he's done talking, if he's ever done talking. Um, similarly, like in the in the in the in the in the law codes, right? Uh, the law codes are going to be pretty. The law codes, by for their all right. Here's what I'm going to ask: is when you're reading the law codes, they're usually very much over determining what they're trying to say. 
you know, they tell you what the law is. And then especially like the casuistic law, it's going to keep throwing in more like scenarios. So you understand exactly what, what is supposed to happen if a person digs a tunnel into your house or if a person accidentally sets fire to your field. Right. Does that make sense? And there's yeah, not a, ox gore is somebody else's. Yeah. Yeah. And there can be some rhetoric going on in there. But for the most part, they are not doing that poetic thing of under determining the meaning. Right. Uh, they're over determining meeting. They're going to keep hammering home, you know, as much as they can. Where and and like whereas like a Paul like and this is this is what interests me as a person who 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 is in, who who, felt, who studies illusion, right? Um, sometimes Paul will make his point in a way that looks very over determined. He's going to be, I guess you could say, as literal as possible. He's going to he's going to throw down literal ordered speech in every way that he can to try to make his point. But other times he will use figurative devices like metaphor and illusion. And in these, and this is, I think, you know that this is a part of what really attracts me about metaphor and about illusion is the person actually is trying to make a point that they want you to get, but they have chosen to do it in such a way that it's possible for you to get it wrong, right? That they, they've opened it up to where you have to participate in, 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 in bringing the metaphor together and doing something with the metaphor and, and responding to it such that you will get their point. They, they've given you a lot of agency in, in doing that. So or a lot of rope to hang yourself with. A lot of rope to hang yourself. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, the room, to, room to go wrong. What are your thoughts about that with, with, I mean, there's a lot of different rhetorical devices and, and metaphor is one, but if, if someone lays down a metaphor on the way towards making their point, aren't they, you know, if, uh, uh, so for example, to take kind of a ludicrous example in Song of Songs, right? Um, the guy wants to describe the hair of the beloved. And so he says, you know, your hair is like a flock of goats, you know, running down the slopes of Gilead. And it's possible it's possible that I have the kind of background and the kind of connotations in mind that what I'm mostly going to get out of that is like ringworm and fleas, you know, <laughs> and that goats eat garbage. Uh, that my connotations are going to be sort of all over the place and, and maybe not successfully going where this person wants the connotations to be going, presumably in terms of curly, black movement, you know, um, and, and so on. What do you think about that, about this kind of, this choice made in metaphor to enlist the reader and in some ways let those chips fall where they may? Yeah, well, so this actually, I think helps, uh, maybe this segues us a little bit to thinking about reception too. So, all right, well, let me start with this. Maybe it won't lead us to reception. I had a, I had a thought about how we could go there, but, but so there was a poem we were reading. So we're also reading English poetry in this class on Hebrew poetry. So I'm figuring if, if poetry is coming at them from all directions, they'll have a better ear for it. So we read a poem by Yeats, uh, The Second Coming, which you probably know. And they looked at some of the first uh, drafts of this poem. And then we looked at some of the later drafts. And one of the interesting things that happens is the metaphors become more vague in the later drafts. So he's talking about uh, World War I for the most part and the trauma that's taking place post World War I and uh, civil war in Ireland and all of this, uh, the, the, the clues that that's what he's talking about specifically, he removes in the later draft. And so, I was likening that to Jeremiah's use of the metaphor of the foe from the north. So why doesn't Jeremiah just say Babylon? I mean, that's what scholars are like, oh, foe from the north, who else could it be? You know, it's, uh, it's around the time of the exile and Babylon destroys Judah. So of course it's, it's, it's Babylon. But I think what happens when you open up the metaphor even more is that then it has the power to mean in different contexts, in later contexts. So uh, there's a biblical scholar, Armin Long, who talks about the ontic surplus of canonical literature. And so as the prophets in particular are interpreted, or, or, or as the prophetic literature gets redacted, 
it seems as though there's a move to, to take out some of the specificity so that, so that later readers aren't tempered, tempered by it. So that they, so they can then own their own experience to it. To and, that, and that maybe, maybe that's, that's what we're talking, talking about, about when we're talking about, about scripture. scripture. Okay, did something, I'm hearing you, but did something change on your end? Because at least I'm getting a lot of like static and fuzzy while you were talking oh, about uh, this bit. Nope, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't think so. Try unplugging, this could be disastrous. Uh, try unplugging your headset and plugging it back in. You're muted. There you go. Oh, now I can't hear you at all. This was probably the wrong thing to do. Um, do you want to go into settings on Google and see if we have to choose your headset microphone again? Sorry, viewers. I would edit all this out in post if I could, but as a Google Hangout, of course, we can't. Did you check? And it's got the right microphone selected. Let's just look at one thing. Oh no. Huh, okay. I don't know, when your IT guy set you up, did you see that he did anything in particular after plugging in, after just plugging in the headset? Did he follow any additional steps that you can remember? All right. Shoot. Well, we're about at the time that we had to stop anyway, because I was going to be looking forward. I was gonna, probably going to have to stop at 3 o'clock. Here's what I'm going to want to do is I would love to follow up with a short interview with you at some time at our mutual convenience because I want to hear a little bit more about this. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about metaphor and, uh, and see if we can find that link to reception history. And if we do that, then when these are in their final form on YouTube, I can just include in the description um, uh, a link to the second, to the second part of the, uh, to the second part of the video and we'll do it that way. Oh, sorry, Amy, I gave you bad advice by telling you to unplug. Oh, that was the worst. So, um, uh, I'm going to say uh, thanks again. Thank you again to Dr. Amy Erickson, uh, Associate Professor of Hebrew Bible at the Iliff School of Theology, uh, for coming and talking about Hebrew Bible and metaphor. And I'll look forward to picking up a second part to this interview because we got a late start and we got cut off early. Uh, so again, this was in service to UTL 16, the Open Old Testament Learning Event, which can be found at um, util16.net. So, Amy, thanks again. Wave. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, Amy, stay on. Uh, I'm going to stop the broadcast. Stay on, and I'll say goodbye to you properly, even if we can't hear each other quite right. So thanks again to all who are watching.